stability and progress in the Balkans are jeopardized by the short-sighted and unworkable Bosnian settlement imposed by the US of Dayton. Following the peace agreement, Western alliance essentially allowed Bosnia to stagnate. Radovan Karadzic, the most senior Bosnian Serb and war criminal, was left undisturbed by NATO troops who didn't want to arrest him for fear of incurring casualties. And meanwhile, by ignoring the plight of the Kosovo Albanians, the Dayton Agreement paved the way for the next war in Kosovo. Uh, fortunately, however, by the time the full-scale war had spread to Kosovo, the leadership of the two key West European military powers, Britain and France, were in the hands of politicians with a clearer understanding of the need to confront Milosevic. Uh, in France, Jacques Chirac replaced François Mitterrand as French president in 1995. And in the UK, Tony Blair and Labour replaced the Conservatives in 1997. And Blair, in particular, was crucial in stiffening Clinton's resolve in helping to ensure that in Kosovo, uh, Milosevic was finally confronted and defeated. But here, too, the settlement was short-sighted and problematic. And based on securing a peace in the short term, rather than looking to the future. Western leaders had finally recognized the need to defeat and isolate Milosevic and to end Serbian rule over Kosovo. But they did not immediately accept what flowed from this, um, that Kosovo would have to become an independent state. So instead of moving immediately to establish an independent Kosovo, the Western powers allowed the establishment of a UN administration in Kosovo based on UN Security uh, Council Resolution uh, 1244. And this was a, a, great, a grave error in, in the long term. It allowed Russia, through the UN, to become involved in Kosovo. Yet Russia was at the time less dangerous and aggressive than it was later to become, after Vladimir Putin firmly established his regime. And this was really a terrible missed opportunity. You know, not the Western powers not to sort out the Balkans really before Russia came back. I mean, in force, so he had his chance. Russia was weak to really sort things out, and the chance was missed. So you know, it was a mistake. By the time Kosovo's independence was belatedly recognised in 2008, uh, Putin's Russia, using the UN as a fig leaf, was able to intervene aggressively to prevent any solution to the Kosovo question. Uh, meanwhile, the Western powers allowed the Serbs to retain control of the northern part of Kosovo, instead of establishing a strong Kosovo government and control of the entire territory. So Kosovo, alongside Bosnia, remains an unsolved problem and source of instability in the Balkans today. But having said all that, NATO did defeat Milosevic of Serbia and prevent the ethnic cleansing of the Kosovo Albanians. Um, after which the US assisted the forces that overthrew the Milosevic regime in 2000. Pressure on Serbia and also on Croatia to cooperate with the ICTY in the arrest and deportation of war criminals to The Hague has served as a powerful motor for reform in these countries. Um, the um, ICTY served as a stick and the lure of EU membership served as a carrot at prompting the former Yugoslav states to reform democratically. The Croatian and Serbian governments have been forced, in the interest of their EU ambitions, to confront, confront retrograde domestic nationalist forces above a ball over the issue of the Hague Tribunal. Um, the importance of this factor in Balkan domestic politics was graphically illustrated by the assassination of Serbian Prime Minister Zoran Djindjic in 2003 at the hands of the nationalist elements opposed to the co uh, cooperation with the Tribunal. Uh, nevertheless, the pull of EU membership has proven too strong even for the, na for the nationalists to resist. So even after most EU and NATO members recognised Kosovo's independence in 2008, still the pro-European parties won the parliamentary elections in Serbia later that year. The Mon Montenegrin government's dissatisfaction with Serbia's unwillingness to cooperate fully with the ICTY you know, thereby jeopardizing Montenegro's own EU ambitions, uh, catalyzed Montenegro's de declaration of independence from Serbia in 2006. But this was also a very positive process. You know, completing the dissolution of this dead state of Yugoslavia, seeing the process through so that all these states merge and have a future as independent states. 
Um, now this takes us beyond the former Yugoslavia to the wider region of the Balkans and beyond that to Southeast Europe as a whole. The most important geopolitical event in this region in the past two, two decades has been its integration into Euro-Atlantic structures. Uh, all former Warsaw Pact countries outside of the Soviet Union itself, um, as well as Slovenia um, and Baltic states, have joined NATO and the EU since 1997, amounting to a geopolitical revolution from the situation that existed in the Cold War. Uh, Croatia and Albania, of course, joined NATO last year, but are not yet in the EU. And this represented a victory, not only over the communist, communist dictatorships, but before 1989, um, and the division of Europe that they imposed, but also a victory over the conservative, I'm using the term conservative with a small c, over the victory over the conservative forces in West European politics opposed to rapid EU expansion. Um, for example, back in 1989, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher uh, spoke of the need to bring the communist states rapidly into the European community. Um, whereas her predecessor, former British Conservative Prime Minister Edward Heath, was very strongly opposed. Um, and this reflected division, the division in British Conservative ranks, and indeed wider political divisions, between the truly conservative conservatives like Heath, who didn't like change and supported the status quo, and the more radical conservatives like Thatcher, who believed strongly in the expansion of the free world in principle. And not, not, not coincidentally, during the war in Yugoslavia, Heath was a real champion of appeasement, supporting Milosevic, and he was really not on that side, whereas Thatcher was quite hawkish about the need to, you know, oppose, to oppose Milosevic. Um, she was quite a principal defender. Bosnians. Um, likewise, in 1997, um, when NATO invited Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to join, uh, Clinton resisted pressure from those in the West who wanted to extend the invitation also to Slovenia and Romania. Clinton was fundamentally a cautious and conservative statesman. So even though he was liberal, nonetheless, he was quite unwilling to upset the status quo. Um, arguably, um, yes, yeah, so the, the great expansion in both the EU and NATO that took place in the 20th century, uh, 20, 20 and 21st century, and particularly in 2004, represented the triumph over the more conservative and cautious forces in the West. Um, and arguably, this EU expansion perhaps even went a little bit too fast. Um, so that Romania and Bulgaria joined perhaps before they were really quite ready. Um, but expansion has always been dictated by political reasons, um, which are allowed to trump the EU's own rules, which should be done. So Greece was allowed to join the European Economic Community in 1981, and Latvia and Slovenia in 2004, despite their failure to respect the rights of their own national minorities. Um, Slovenia and Cyprus were allowed to join, despite having unresolved border disputes with neighbouring states. So although we can view the expansion of the EU and NATO um, as representing the expansion of the liberal democratic world and the triumph of liberal, the liberal democratic principles, it also reflects short-term polit political considerations on the part of Western policymakers. Um, these considerations, of course, are not always positive and may be damaging to the future of the institutions and to um, Europe as a whole. So whereas the lure of EU membership has acted as a, as a catalyst to democratic reform in the country seeking membership, the process of integration has been distorted and continues to be distorted by these unprincipled compromises. Thus, um, Slovenia, Slovenia's entry into the EU, um, despite the fact that it had a continuing uh, border dispute with Croatia, uh, threatened to derail the whole process of EU expansion in the Western Balkans. Uh, because Slovenia for a long time threatened to block Croatia's entry in, um, in this case. Um, but uh, nevertheless, pressure of, um, from within the EU did actually force Slovenia to moderate its stance, and an agreement was finally reached. Um, but a more serious in, uh, case, uh, the Western world has been much less ready to exert a moderating influence over Greece. 
So in 2004, the EU allowed itself to be pressurized by Greece um, into allowing this divided Cyprus to join the Union. And Greece threatens to veto the accession of all the other new member states that would join over time. So you had Greece, rather a small EU member, not an important one, basically coercing the whole of the EU to let in Cyprus, which wasn't really a very sensible thing to do. Cyprus was, was allowed, Cyprus was allowed to join unconditionally. And this allowed the Greek Cypriot leadership to reject the 2004 and unplan the re reunification of the island of Cyprus. Uh, the Greek Cypriots who vetoed the plan were rewarded um, with EU membership, while the uh, Turkish Cypriots who accepted the plan were punished again with made in isolation. Not a very just, just thing to do. And now Cyprus's membership of the EU enormously complicates the already difficult process of Turkey's accession. Um, meanwhile, Greece, as an EU and NATO member, is being allowed to veto Macedonia, Macedonia's membership of both organizations. Um, by allowing this, the US and the EU are effectively concluding an act of regional nationalist bullying that could, be, that could have highly damaging consequences for regional stability. Uh, the slow process of Macedonia's EU accession heightens tensions between the ethnic Macedonians, ethnic Albanians, and Macedonia. And a collapse of the Macedonian state would have catastrophic consequences for Europe. Uh, Greece's behavior is, consi is consistently irresponsible, from supporting Milosevic to sabotaging Western efforts in Kosovo and in Cyprus, to the recent Greek financial crisis that threatened the future of the Euro. The Euro. But nevertheless, Greece always receives a blank check from the EU. So in the case of Greece and Macedonia, as in the earlier case of the um, uh, Slovenia and Croatia, the EU has not acted as a catalyst for more enlightened behaviour on the part of the states of the region. On the contrary, it has actually encouraged aggressive nationalist behaviour by giving regional troublemakers that happen to be ready members an advantage over their victims. Um, nor has the EU been able to discipline its rogue members over the question of Kosovo's independence. Only five EU members fail to recognize Kosovo's independence. Uh, they are, as you of course all, all know, uh, in Greece and, in the first of Greece and Cyprus, which are traditional allies of Serbia, uh, which have never pursued responsible policies in the region. And then you have Romania and Slovakia, which are extremely crude, immature democracies, but see the Kosovo question in the most narrow minded and nationalistic terms, in terms of their own Hungarian minorities, supposedly secessionist you know, tendencies. Very, very narrow-minded. Um, and thirdly, Spain, uh, which allows its policy towards Kosovo to be dictated not by any respect for stability and progress in the Balkans, but purely by its own nationalistic fear of Catalan and Basque independence. So the EU allows its most selfishly nationalistic members to prevent the emergence of a common policy that would benefit the Balkans and Europe as a whole. But to be fair, this, this problem is not confined just to a few troublemakers and to an exceptional case like Spain. Larger EU members uh, also were ready to jeopardize the stability of Southeast Europe and the wider interests of Europe in order to serve their own narrow national interests as they see them. And chief among these, I'd like to say, are France and Germany, 